Uh, yesterday, uh, the groundswell, who have become a bit of a phenomena in this country, <coughs> they really grew up largely as a grassroots rural protest movement in this country because their view was that at the time, their chosen political leaders, whether they be Federated Farmers or the National Party, weren't being as direct of as effective as they thought. They were originally formed to oppose, I think it was the New Zealand government's national policy statement on freshwater. But since then, have staged last year the Nationwide Howl, a protest campaign, uh, and also the mother of all protests that they held last year as well. <coughs> they have become very much a ginger group um, who have argued very strongly that farmers and rural communities are being disadvantaged on an almost institutional basis by government policies. And yesterday, they had the remarkable good fortune to meet with the Prime Minister and a series of other government leaders um, at Parliament um, to talk about their concerns. And they turned a half-hour meeting with the Prime Minister into an hour. Uh, joining us is to talk about that meeting, but also the consequences of, um, as, a co as the co-founder of Groundswell, Bryce McKenzie. Bryce, good morning to you. Thank you for coming on the show. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, good day, Michael. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me on. Good on you. Um, now, just going back to the formation before we talk about yesterday, I, I was always under the pro. Uh, I was under the impression that it came post twenty twenty. But you actually started before that, didn't you? Uh, no, we didn't actually, Mike. Oh, I you think didn't. It was the in August 2020, to be quite honest. Uh, so we've only been just going just over two years, really. Right. So and it was. That, it, is it right to say that you were you were originally formed because of the national policy statement on freshwater management? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, Michael. It was. Uh, I, I'm a founding member of the Pomahaka Water Care Group, which has probably got national recognition now for some of the great work it's done, and it's won many awards. And uh, through that, it was when the National Policy Statement on Fresh Water came out, and I took one look at it and thought, this is absolutely loony, this just will not work. And uh, I did what most uh, husbands do, they moan to their wives, Michael, so... I did that until she got absolutely fed up with me and said, well, why don't you do something about it? So I actually wrote a, uh, a Facebook post and it went viral. So, um, And I had mentioned in that Facebook post that farmers shouldn't take this lying down. They should get in the tractors and they should drive to Wellington. Well, I mean, it got so much of a response that... Um, uh, one particular person, uh, Laurie Patterson from Waikaka, who I'd known but not really very well, uh, he contacted me and he said, yeah, I think we should do something, so let's start with a protest in Gore. Uh, so we got together and organised that, expecting him and I would be the only ones to turn up. We were didn't know if we could get the message out. We both put posts on our own private Facebook page, uh, pages saying we were going to go to Gore and get our tractors serviced. And uh, we wanted some company to come with us. Well, there was over 100 tractors turned up. And uh, <laughs> we basically, <laughs> we brought Gore to a standstill. So we realised then that this feeling was uh, running deep within the uh, rural uh, community. Mm. And um, you now have, do you have Groundswell branches throughout New Zealand now? Do you, Laurie? Uh, Bryce, sorry. Yes, yeah, we do, Michael. Uh, we've got a number of branches and more setting up all the time. So we've got quite a network uh, right throughout New Zealand now. Um, and that just started because we got coordinators on board to actually help run the protests. Uh, some of them decided they were going to set up their own groups and they've done that. So, yeah, we've got them spread right throughout New Zealand. So roughly how many do you think you would have now? How many groups? Yeah. How many? Uh, look, we've, we have a have a meeting, a Zoom meeting, uh, and it varies. We invite about 70 coordinators, so only one person from each area that we have on our records as coordinators. Uh, we can get, uh, I think the most we've had is about 
35 or 36, but we have a meeting the next month and there could be a whole new group. So we limited one from each area, uh, otherwise we think we'd just get bogged down with too many coming on board. Okay, now, the hell of a protest and all those protests in 2021, the mother of all protests and things like that, they were very effective at highlighting that particular issue. Subsequent to that, before we talk again, again about the Prime Minister's meeting, do you think that had an effect upon more traditional farming leaders, for example, those in Federated Farmers and the like, to take a more proactive stance on these issues? It probably didn't happen initially. I know uh, we meet, met with the leaders, uh, uh, chairman of those organisations, and initially we were trying to support them and get a message out to urban people and try and reach uh, the uh, rural people as well. So we, it was started as a support for them. Unfortunately, uh, we become fragmented because the further into it we got, the more we realised that, uh, our, uh, particularly our levy-paying organisations, because Federated Farmers, as you understand, is subscription-based. You don't like what they do, you don't pay your sub. Uh, with levy organisations, they have their own sort of hierarchy. Uh, they uh, elect their chairman and their committee and then they're there for three years with, and you can't do anything about it. And they collect levies off you continually, uh, massive amounts of money, and they basically uh, determine what they like when it comes to negotiating with government without talking to farmers about it in most instances. Yeah, um, and I, I think one of the interesting things when you started up as well is that um, you had you attract people who were really angry and some who were pretty undisciplined in their views. You, you slapped them down pretty quick, didn't you? Yes, we did, Michael. Um, I mean, it's a matter of having to. We had to. We had coordinators that we had to dismiss um, uh, uh, for a bit, not. Uh, because of any other reason other than the fact that they were using our platform to push their own agendas. And uh, what we found out was that, that people actually reported these other people very, very quickly. So even if they uh, were putting something on their Facebook page that was not in line with what Groundswell stood for, we would get people calling us and saying, hey, do you know your coordinator is doing this? So we could keep up with coordinators through other people and we knew then that we were getting buy-in from a lot of people because we've become self-monitoring and you need a lot of people for, for that to happen. Yeah, so that also made it easier, I guess, to defend yourself with those elements in the media or politically that would attack you for those sort of fringe dwellers, right? Yes, dead right. And uh, we, we probably never got a lot of attack ourselves. Um, what happened was, and I, as I go back to, was most uh, some of those people actually were trying to push their own opinions. And uh, some of them got in trouble with the media more so than in trouble with us because we just said, look, you can no longer carry on with us because that's not the views that we hold. So, uh, yeah, that's how it come about, really. Right, OK. Um, now... You've, you've stuck to your knitting. I think that would be the, 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 the basic of it. You haven't endorsed or um, associated yourself necessarily with other um, other causes, if you like, whether it's Voices for Freedom or, um, you know, Taxpayers Union or things like that. Is that right? That you've, you've tended to try to... Listen, this is all about... This, these are the policies affecting rural people and these are why we think they're wrong and these are why we think this is a better way to go. Yeah? Exactly right, Michael. Look, it's so easy to get carried away with emotive things. And, you know, there's, there's things that we've been asked to do that we've had sympathy for. But if you're going to be credible in the long term, you have to stick to your knitting. You can't uh, jump on board everything that is anti-government just because um, that's anti-government. I mean, that, that just doesn't bring credibility in the finish. So being credible is all about... Uh, being faithful to those people who who follow you because they think you have a particular cause that they think is worth fighting for. Mm, okay. Um, where have you found most of your, you know, who are the kind of people that you would say have been most 
destructive or um, most opposed your message have you found over the last couple of years? Uh, I don't know that there's any particular group. I think there's been more individuals that have that have tried to be destructive, uh, and they would be individuals that think we're not doing what they think we should be, and that's always the problem you get. And some of them branch away and form their own sort of organisation and and try and bring you into line through another organisation. So I wouldn't say there's any particular organisation. It's more individuals. Yeah. All right. Now. Um the really interesting thing is that you have obviously a credibility. Otherwise, the Prime Minister would not have agreed to meet with you yesterday. How did that meeting get set up? Okay. Uh, you might recall that we launched a petition um, uh, against uh, taxing uh, uh, emissions on food producers, was what it was. We, we believed that it was wrong to... Uh, tax methane emissions on food producers and that's that's what we pushed now we set up a, a petition and it ran for just on a day short of a month and we got a hundred and two thousand signatures yeah. so so we we knew then that the government would have to take us serious and and we had some ex-politicians that actually contacted us and said you don't realize the power of what you've got and you need to send a letter to the Prime Minister and request a meeting because you have a duty now to speak on behalf of those uh, 100 odd thousand people. And uh, to be honest, we hadn't thought of requesting another meeting because, uh, as you well know, earlier on we got invited to a meeting and uh, turned it down, which I alluded to yesterday at our meeting that we'd got away to a pretty checkered start with the government. Um, so we we did discuss that just briefly, but yeah. So it was basically to stay faithful to those hundred thousand people that we would take a message to government and tell them what they had basically told us they wanted us to talk about. Okay, and so the prime minister says yes. Did that surprise you that she said yes? It did surprise us. I'd have to say we were very surprised. Uh, we were probably more surprised that she brought along, uh, I think it was five ministers with her, that being Damien O'Connor, uh, James Shaw, um, who else was there, Mika Watari, and... Um, uh, McEnulty. McEnulty? That, uh, yeah, that's right, Kieran McEnulty. So uh, it, was, it was really good uh, that they were there also because we could talk about more than just the fact that 100,000 people were annoyed about their emissions policy. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess she also she would have been to the recent uh, field days and got the message pretty clearly too uh, from the rural community. I guess that would have had a bit of influence on it. Uh, Michael, I, you know, we never discussed that, but and I mean, there's more than that, as we well know. We know that Hamilton West didn't go very well. No, is that too? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So there's there's all sorts of pressures probably mounting, and uh, I guess the rural voice has been very loud, and field days would have showed that up. So maybe they thought, well, hang on a minute, maybe we have got to talk to rural people and find out what's going on. And, and which which they did, okay. So you sit down. You're in. Um, you're on the ninth floor, or wh where'd you meet? Oh, look, I can't even remember what number. You know, when you get in the beehive, it's hard enough to yeah, find yeah, the correct yeah, lift without yeah. finding the correct. Yeah, floor. That, no, that's right. You just got in the lift and off you went. Okay. Um, so you go <laughs> sit down there. Um, how many of there were you? Were there well, same number, five or six? No, four. Okay, four of us. Who did you take? Apart from you and... All right. Laurie. Yeah. Myself, Laurie, we took our operations manager, uh, who is Melanie Cupid, who is based here in Gore, and we took uh, Jamie McFadden, who is our um, environmental spokesman from Canterbury. He come with us, so that, that there was the four <laughs> of us. Okay. Uh, one of the things that immediately is, is how southern you are, have you got the same sort of support, picking up the same sort of support from the sort of the big farming areas of the north, you know, Taranaki, Waikato, Hawke's Bay, Wairapa, that sort of areas? Yes, look, we have groups all round through there. Um, some of them are active, some of them aren't. 
So it depends. I mean, if an issue in a particular area will highlight uh, what people do, who they contact, how they respond to it. So um, to say they're all active and fighting policy in their own area all the time, I couldn't say they're doing that. But certainly when it becomes major, they reach out to us. All right. Now, what was the meeting like? So uh, I would anticipate that that could be quite tense, was it? Yes, it, it certainly was initially. It was quite tense. Um because we had a message we wanted to portray to them, and it was a serious message, so we wanted to treat it seriously. Um, and we started off with, the, I guess, the destruction of rural areas and rural communities through this horrible thing of uh, tree planting. Yeah, carbon and, farming. Uh, yeah. The, the car yeah, carbon farming. And we discussed that for too long probably because we went into a lot quite a bit of detail as they did and the message that came out of it was that they are probably a little bit embarrassed by it they uh, aren't actually sure how they can stop it because the the they say they're concerned if they step in then they're going to be accused of manipulating the market and stopping farmers doing uh, what they want to do with their own land so there's probably a wee bit of an element in truth in that, but we tried to point out to them that the present structure of the ETS is something that needs to be looked at to, to stop that from happening. And I guess they're a bit worried about how they do that. And, and they certainly indicated that it was a bigger uh, problem than they had first anticipated and that they weren't actually too sure how they were going to uh, bring it, changes to it. Mm, okay, so you've done the carbon farming, but what what else did you discuss? Well, we talked about trust, and uh, and I brought up the fact that because I'd been part of standing against the national policy statement on fresh water, that that's where it all started. They they broke the trust of rural people, particularly food producers, initially, and they never repaired that trust. They sent politicians out into the country to tell farmers and food producers what they were going to do. They got a resounding uh, warning that farmers said this cannot happen, it won't work. They uh, persisted and uh, of course the consequences of it all were they got so much objection, I think it was 18,000 submissions, which for farmers is unbelievable because they're not into that sort of thing at all. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 that's where it all started. I'm sorry, I, I just got waylaid. Somebody tried to call me. <laughs> I went off the train of thought for a second. That's all right. So that, that's, that, that's where it all started. And, um, and I said, you haven't repaired that. And you haven't repaired it because it's still some things in there that are absolutely uh, appalling to farmers and you've, uh, they need changed and they need addressed uh, as soon as you possibly can. Uh, they didn't understand them. And I talked about the slope mat in particular, which is dear yep. to farmers' hearts. Yep. Um, and I explained the, what happens in my own property. Well, uh, I'll just say, I know what you mean, but that's because I'm on a regional council. Can you explain to our listeners right. what the slope map is, please? Okay, so what they've stipulated is that uh, you cannot, without a c uh, consent, you cannot plant a crop, uh, uh, particularly for winter grazing, uh, which is a high-quality feed that we need in the south to feed our stock through the winter, and you cannot plant that on a area where the slope is over 10 degrees, which is not very steep. No. And that's, that's regardless of anything else. Now, being in the position of understanding what happens through the water care group, we know that farmers are now becoming responsible to mitigate any problems associated with that. And in my own instance, we have a lot of rolling country. Now, on that rolling country, it drops off into steeper gullies, and most of those gullies are lined with tussocks in the bottom of them or uh, carrack sectors, rushes, that sort of thing. Now, we all know how good they are at purifying water, but what happens is you leave these big buffer zones so you don't get the soil movement off there that's ever going to reach a waterway. Now, I've got perfectly beautiful flat country, 
And I don't do any cropping on that flat country, or my sons don't now, because we've learnt through experience that if we work that country up and we get an extreme rain event in the headwaters of our rivers, we lose all our topsoil and flooding. Now, I was explaining this to them, and I tell you what, there was a few light switches that come on. That, that you cannot sit in Wellington and make a regulation and think it's going to work when you don't understand the consequences of it and how it affects a, a farmer in his day-to-day life. And that's what they're doing, and that's why this piece of legislation was so wrong and why they've had to change so much of it, and they still haven't finished it off. Mm. Right. Um, no, I guess the thing is, and you and I, and I know for the frustration of dealing with Wellington bureaucrats who would have actually composed the legislation and who then would be giving it to people like regional councils to interpret how that legislation should be interpreted. I guess the frustration for you is that you don't know how many people who understand farming are sitting in those Wellington bureaucratic offices, sitting over them saying, that will work, that will not work, do you? No, we don't. And we have some sympathy for environment um, and rural um regional councils because they're they've been tasked <coughs> with enforce something that should never actually have to be enforced and we've learned that you get far more change through education rather than regulation and that's what's wrong with us that everybody thinks you can regulate people into actually doing it but if it can't be done it can't be done it's simple as that michael yeah okay so it goes on for a lot longer than the half hour you had planned um you're talking about carbon farming you're just talking about the whole concept of trust you're talking about slope maps. Was there any other important issues that you discussed yesterday? Yeah, definitely. The main one was the future of farming and the mental health of the people in rural places. Look, uh, we couldn't enforce hard enough and we brought up people that they need to talk to and they did. They took notes and said we will contact those people about the mental health state. Uh, of rural people and uh, which is being brought on by over-regulation and of course they tried to blame it on COVID and all sorts of things. We well, said that's not the case. A farmer can actually escape COVID ver- very easily in his day-to-day life because he just goes out on the farm and does his mm. work. Mm. So to him that's not really an issue. What the issue is is whether he's being allowed to go out and do that work or he's got to spend most of his time inside working out how he's allowed to do it. So uh, we were talking about that. And, of course, the consequence of that is who is going to grow the food in the future because succession planning is falling away because sons of uh, generational farmers are saying, this is too freaking hard, I don't want to do it anymore. So you've got that, and then you've got the uh, combined effort of the mental stress. So people are just shying away from the occupation. They don't want to be associated with it. Um, that's an interesting concept because if I was a son of yours and I said I don't want to farm and I had a brother who said the same thing, what does that leave you doing as a farmer? Does that mean that you sell to somebody else, right? Yeah, look, for, and my, that would normally be the case. Uh, I can only talk in my own situation. Their land is in a trust, so uh, the trust uh, leases the land out to my sons so um, I guess the the opportunity would be somebody else would get a chance of leasing that land out um, but yes in most instances if the sons don't want to take it over that's what would happen, it would go on the market and right now if it was a sheep and beef farm it would go into trees probably without any doubt at all and uh, I, I, something people may not realise, Michael, is that we had the Climate Change Commission down Friday last week, a week ago today. Uh, they are responsible for land and waste. Now, they have really had their eyes open to what takes place on a farm. Um, I'm sure that none of them had been... Well, one of them had actually been on a farm before, but the other ones were domiciled in the city and uh, admitted that they very rarely uh, go anywhere near a farm. So it was actually just explaining to them what actually happens on a farm. 
and how the day-to-day running of a farm is, uh, you can't do it without, first of all, considering the environment and, uh, of course, uh, climate, because farming is so climate-related, re- as we all know. You just don't do things when it's wet that... Uh, um, Not going to work. You can't get... Yeah. yeah, exactly. It doesn't work. Uh, but so, but the, the Climate Change Commission, people, was that Rod Carr that came down or some of the staff? No, look, uh, some of those staff, they, ha- they have so many different categories of people in climate change, and their job, of course, as we all know, is to uh, speak to government, make recommendations to government. Uh, there was one or two things that really uh, perked them up, that they thought, man, this is unreal, and I don't really want to go into it, not with because what it would do is advertise a company, and, I mean, we've got to be very careful that we don't go pushing one company above another but there are some really wonderful technological advances in agriculture that will make massive differences on how we run our farms Um, and just to give you a little bit of heads up it's like electronic fencing and that sort of thing so that is here now and it's it's operable and we're going to do it ourselves and we explained it to the climate change commission who had never heard of it were absolutely blown away so I guess for us, and it always has been, is the market, and we talked to the, to the, climate change, uh, to the government about it yesterday, that we've always believed that the market will actually determine what we do in the future. So we're already hearing that Nestle is talking to Fonterra and saying, you've got to cut your carbon footprint. So that is going to reflect on the farmers that supply Fonterra. They're going to have to make changes because Fonterra will demand it of them. And we've always said that that's the way it should be handled, that the message will come through our pricing on what we get for our stuff, not by taxation. Mm. So, okay, I I get what you're saying. Um, What seems to be here, though, is the classic cleavage between, as you say, people on the ground and between people in a Wellington office um, coming up with the rules, the legislation and the regulations. Uh, so do you think at the end of that hour, and I guess the proof will always be in the pudding, that you made sufficient impression upon the Prime Minister and the Ministers to do anything? Did they give you any categorical assurances at all? Look, they, de- they said definitely they will look at a couple of issues. They said that that is without doubt. They will look at them. Uh, did they say they'll change anything? No, and I guess we'd it'd be unrealistic to think we would ever have got that out of them anyway. Um, I think one thing that they did become aware of, Michael, was that uh, we weren't just a, an, a fringe idiot group that uh, was uh, just um, kicking up a fuss for the sake of it, that they realised that we have a lot of people behind us. In fact, even asked us, would we be prepared to help reach the farmers if we could see value in something they were doing. And we said, yes, we could, as long as we could see the value in it. So uh, they realised that, you know, we have a reach, we can reach into a lot of people's lives. We have uh, 120, over 120,000 on our database. We have uh, 1.25 million interactions on our uh, social media. Um, so we have, can reach a lot of people, and they were actually very impressed with that. Yeah, but I guess, I guess, I mean, if I was thinking from their point of view, and after you've lost, the four of you have left the room, and the doors have closed, and just the minister and the officials are left, and the ministers get together, at their heart of hearts, they would have said, "Is there any point in us doing anything anyhow? Because will these buggers even vote for us?" Do you think that? Politi- <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, you're exactly right. And Jacinda Ardern even said that to us. She said, listen, we all know that farmers hate us and won't vote for us anyway. So that, she just said exactly what you've said, didn't she? Mm. Mm. Oh, at least she was honest <laughs> enough to say it to your face. Um, so, I did, Hang on, though, Michael. I did actually point out to her that uh, there'd be a lot of the senior farmers that would say they've done better under a Labor government than they actually did under a national government. And that was pretty generally thought about uh, certainly some time ago, not so recently, though. You mean before the 2000 election, 2020 election? <laughs> That's what I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you might, you might have to thank Winston Peters for that, just quietly, and New Zealand first. Oh, no, come on, Michael. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious, actually, because I, 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 he was there acting as a bridge. So once he wasn't there, the gates opened, didn't they? 
I mean, you've many of these yeah, things have happened subsequent to the election in 2020, haven't they? Yes, you're right. But who was it that put the, this government there? Well, yeah, but who said that they weren't going to form a coalition with them? Well, yeah, good point. But I yeah, mean, just quietly. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Look, mm. yeah, there's pros and cons. I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. yes. Um, all right. <laughs> going forward now, though, um, where does ground... So you've had a huge year, and I guess in a funny sort of way, you couldn't have had a better end to a year than getting that audience with people who are going to be making decisions. Where do you go next year with Groundswell, Bryce? Uh, yeah, look, I guess that's a challenge all the time. We keep saying to ourselves, oh, well, you know, we've been there, done that, we can tick that off, and I guess that's the way government operates a little bit. And uh, we say, well, you know, that's it, we'll probably be able to pack our bags and go home. But there always seems to be something else, and we always have people reaching out to us saying, do you understand this? Look, we turn down so much uh, individual stuff because we just can't afford to get involved in not that sort of organisation. There's a lot of injustice out there, and I guess there's always going to be things to do. Like, we met with the National Party, um, Nicola Willis and uh, Todd Muller. We met with that, and... You know, we made it quite plain to them that just because they might win an election doesn't mean that we're going to go away because there's still injustices <laughs> in the rural sector that need fought. And mm, I mm. guess that's going to always be the way. That's the, the, the way things are now for some reason. Everybody wants to have control over everybody else. Well, and, and you, I think you make a good point. Uh, there's, if you look at the history of um, New Zealand politics over the last 40-odd years, just because a national party comes in doesn't mean to say anything changes. No, no, that's right. Yeah, it, it does not. And we've seen that in the past where um, uh, in election time people say, well, you know, we're going to throw this out or we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But very rarely do they change much at all. Um, they may make tweaks to things. So, uh, yeah, it's one of those things we need to watch. And, I mean, that brings us back to elections and our groundswell going to have a political party. No, we're not. We think that we're more effective outside politics and inside it as such yeah so uh and we think that to endorse anybody is a dangerous uh president because uh the minute you do that and we know everybody's fallible and if something goes wrong then your organization endorsed this person how did this happen so no we know that people are pretty wise about making their own decisions and we're quite happy to let them do that so just to clarify that you won't be setting up as a political party at the next election, and neither will you be endorsing any political party at the next election. That is the intention at this stage, Michael. And, I, you know, for me personally, I say no, but then it's an organisation, so you can't just categorically write everything off. But uh, I would hate to see us go down that track. Uh, no, I, listen, you can't, I think you can't be a good lobby group if you enter the political process on one side. That's how to stop being a lobby group, isn't it? Because you've, you've got to have credibility. That said, at the next election, oh, and I guess your membership has got a lot of choices at the next election, haven't they? I mean, let's just say I yes, wanted to change the government. I've got National, I've got ACT, I've got New Zealand First. I mean, I've got at least three choices, realistic choices I could go, haven't I? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yes, you did, right. And there's more... Pro uh, I'm actually right now, I've been at a meeting, I come out of a meeting with the Heartland Party. So everybody... And I mean, we met with New Zealand first, and we're quite happy to listen to all of them because I think that's everybody's duty to actually find out what these offer. And, uh, you know, there's some really interesting concepts and some people have really uh, bright ideas. And it's good for us to actually learn them. But will we support any of these parties at this stage? No. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, Bryce. Um, it's a really great way to review the year and Groundswell. It's been really good talking to you guys this year um, and having the opportunity to have these kind of discussions on much more than a sort of bumper sticker process, but getting into the depth. Um, I think you've represented your people really well. Uh, and can I just say, I hope that your personal views hold sway because you'll be around for a lot longer if you do. Thank you, Michael, and uh, I will endeavour to do that, but we all know in organisations at times you lose your personal views for 
the, yeah. the majority. Yeah. No. yeah. Good on you. Okay. Have a great one. Nice okay. to talk to you, Bryce. Thank you, Michael. Okay. See you later, mate. Um, that's Bryce McKenzie. He was the co-founder. In fact, was, I didn't know that, but it was his. It was his first Facebook post. Ah, and then Laurie contacts him, and bang, off they go. There you go.